I think there were four or five lawyers in the Ramonia trial. And I'm going to start with the lawyers that had the longest impact on South African history. Uh, the first was a man called Brown Fisher, Abraham Fisher. And he was the son of a leader of the Free State. He was an Afrikaner man. He was Afrikaans. And he could have become Prime Minister of Apartheid in South Africa because he was a brilliant, brilliant legal scholar and very thoughtful man. But he became a member of the Communist Party and his wife, Molly uh, Fisher, she had recruited him into the Communist Party. And she was a communist leader herself. And Bram Fischer, Bram Fischer uh, was capable of separating in the courtroom his politics with focusing clearly on legal argument, but understanding that legal argument served politics. And a terrible tragedy happened to Brown Fisher after the Rebellion trial. He and his wife Molly and their children were on their way to Cape Town. To take, they were first taking a break and then they were going to, uh, he was going to come visit the Rebellion trials here. And Brown and Molly were even closer than Walter and Albertina were as, as husband and wife. They were amazing, really amazing human beings together. And on the way there, he swerved the car when something was happening. And the car overturned and Molly drowned in the Little River. And he went in to see Madiban when he had to, after the funeral, not after the funeral, he went in, went to Cape Town, saw Madiba and them, and Madiba said to him, how's Molly? And he just said, he just said, let's talk about you. Um, and he didn't show his feeling to Madiba, and because he didn't want to upset them. But of course they, they were going to find out. The warders probably told him. So, Brown Fisher, was a senior leader. Of the, if, in fact, I, he was the he was the uh, one of the key leaders of the Communist Party, and a man of serious uh, politics. He himself was later tried and put on trial. He went underground. He had many disguises. His terrible family tragedies. His son died. Had terrible. They kept him in jail for as long as possible, and only let him out at the end when he was dying of cancer. Um, solitary confinement, all of it, but a man who carried himself with enormous, enormous dignity. So he was one of the lawyers. The other lawyer was not a political activist, and that was Arthur Chaskelson. And many of you will know that he was the first president of the Constitutional Court of South Africa, and later became the Chief Justice of the whole of South Africa. And of any lawyer, uh, I didn't work with him as an attorney ever, or I, I mean when he was a lawyer, when he was counsel, uh, when he was an advocate, but I knew of him. I knew of his work. The one thing he always did, the most important thing to him, was the people who he represented in court. So he would spend more time learning about people, more time learning about people and the people he represented. Then he showed in consultation about his legal studies related to the case. He didn't show his legal knowledge in relation to the case. In his consultation with people, he always spoke to people about where their families are from, what they do, what their history, what motivates them, what they're scared of, so he gets to know them. But when he goes home, he, or back to work, 
he had the most formidable, patient legal mind. And he had the softest voice that was very strong. So when he spoke, he sounded boring. Especially when he grew older, he sounded boring. But you never, when, once you start listening to him, you follow right through to the end. Because what he says is so clear and so thought out and so careful. So he analyzed all the evidence, thousands and thousands of pages. And then there was George Bezos, who many of you will also have heard of. And he's still alive today. And George Bezos came to South Africa when he was a little child with his father as a refugee from the civil war that was happening when America had armed right -wing, uh, the right wing in Greece to prevent the national liberation movement of Greece from freeing it and to establish a communist uh, government. So he, he and his father flee to South Africa and he put himself through school and worked, you know, worked very hard. So he understood what it was to come from poverty and to come from nothing and to be able to uh, have the privilege of representing people. But he was also at Wits University at the same time Madiba was, so he knew Madiba personally. And he was always an ANC supporter too. So, you, you have the lawyers who were, who were never members of political parties, and you have the lawyers who were members of the political parties. And then you also had a man called Vernon Barange, who was one of the best, most eloquent lawyers, and Ian Hansen. And then you had this chappie called Joel Joffe, who, when you feel like reading a book, the book of Joel Joffe on the trial, the Ravonia trial, where a lot of the material you will get will come from. That book, he explains what happened. He was also a lawyer who knew nothing about politics. But because no other attorney would take on the case, no other attorney would take on the case. You see, my knowledge comes out of these, reading these ones, and you're going to read them. Over time. Over time. Don't worry. And if you don't read them, it's also fine. <laughs> um, but as long as you read. Um, it, th this, is, this has some of the most beautiful stories in it. And this gives you a beautiful family history as well as a political history. They both do. And the, the, the thing about jo Joel Joffe was that he knew nothing about politics, but no one else would take on the defense of Madiba and the, and the Ravonia trialists. And he just decided that attorneys need to be represented. And he's still alive too. And today, he is a Lord Justice in England. He's on England's highest court, the highest court in England, Scotland, uh, England and Wales. Um, and he's a, he's a great judge and he also continues to raise funds for the Legal Resources Centre and, and, and other organisations that need support so even in his very old age so he, the trial politicised him and he saw the integrity of the leaders in the trial now to come to the question of someone who didn't have integrity and that was the prosecutor he was a man called Percy Utah. And most of us will never forgive Madiba for forgiving him. Um, and Percy Utah was the opposite in every way of what the lawyers of the Ravonia Tyler's were. The opposite. He didn't know much law. He didn't study law carefully. So his first charge sheet was chucked out by the judge because it didn't, it cited the National High Command of the ANC of Contra Vesizwe. 
and there's no such body. And it had charges which weren't properly formulated. So there was very little law in it. But there was lots of pro-apartheid speeches in these things about proving how so and so, and a lot of personal smearing of, of individual leaders, really personal smearing of individual leaders. And sorry, I don't normally do this, but Ian made me some tea <laughs> because we were starting. Um, he, he gets punished because he's a white boy. <laughs> All right, um, so he, Percy Utah didn't know much law, but he also smeared individual uh, leaders of the ANC. Like during the trial, he would say, uh, he would get the state witness, who was a real terrible informer, Bruno Mtolo, um, to say that he went to Walter Sisulu's house and Mandela's house and they lived in luxury. And if you knew their houses in Soweto, yeah, I they weren't, at that time, they certainly weren't anything like what they know. Um, and meantime, the ANC members were suffering. So uh, that's the sort of smears he would use against uh, the people. And he took all his instructions from the security police. And he wouldn't give documents to, to the lawyers. He'd only give them at the very last minute uh, the documents that they needed to prepare their witnesses and to prepare their trial and to cross-examine. But because he wanted to make speeches Here's a quick story of what he did, and he wanted his speeches to be heard across the world. He, on the first day of the trial, because the media, the South African media were very much against the Rabonia trials, largely. Maybe one or two newspapers like the Rand Daily Mail and so on. But the vast majority of newspapers like the Sunday Times and so on, basically called the ANC leaders terrorists, right? And the SABC, like it is now the voice of the ANC, was the voice of the National Party. And so the court started. Who, who have you heard about Oscar Pistorius here? Everyone, of course. Now, what happened before, what's happened with Oscar's trial? Now. Now. Uh, what's happening now? They're broadcasting it, right? They're broadcasting it now. But and they are the, the neighbor. Yeah. No, 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 I just, I just want the broadcasting. Oh, so, okay. so they're broadcasting this now so we can see the neighbor giving evidence and all that okay. stuff and hear it and so on. Now, what, what had to happen before they broadcasted it? People had to make application to the judge to say this is a public interest. I don't know why, but it's a public interest. And the judge ruled that some of it they can, they can record and so on. No, on the first day of the trial, this man had given his entire argument copies of it to every journalist and he'd arranged for the SABC mics to be put in front of him and in front of the judge. And the lawyers got up and they said, sorry, but no one said here that it can be broadcast. And the judge said, I didn't give permission. And so the SABC didn't get a chance to broadcast his great speech about what terrible people they were. So. Now there's an interesting thing about Percy Utah. Like, like Arthur Chaskelson and like Dennis Goldberg and like uh, Rusty Bernstein and Harold Wolpe, Percy Utah was Jewish. And a very interesting thing happened. He wanted to prove to the apartheid state that not all Jewish people were communists. That's one of the things. He was on his knees in front of the apartheid state to get them to recognize him as a human being and to protect the Jewish community. Now one thing you must remember is that the Nazis killed millions of Jews. Six million Jewish people were killed by the Nazis, along with about 300,000 gay men, uh, with lesbians, and in gas chambers and so on. So the Jewish people felt very, very insecure. Very, very insecure. And the Jewish community was divided into two things. And the National Party here supported the, the Nazis, like John Forster and Favut, um, uh, and all, all of them made spe speeches against Jewish people and so on. And a majority of the Jewish community were scared, and they wanted to win the National Party over. 
to their side to not to not oppress them. And a minority of Jewish people took the side of the liberation movement and said, because of what our people have suffered, we have a duty to be part of supporting oppressed people everywhere. So you had Jewish people like Arthur Chaskelson and and, and uh, Rusty Bernstein and Dennis Goldberg on the one hand and Ruth First and Ray Alexander was probably one of the best trade union leaders in, in, in the world. Um, Jewish people like that who said we're part of the working class, we're part of the struggle. Ray was working class, Joe was working class, we're part of the, the, the struggle. And you had those who were so scared of the apartheid state that they begged for recognition. And Percy Utah was one of the most cowardly people. He was terribly coward, terribly bombastic, and knew little law. So if you read the Ravonian trial transcript, you will find that he comes off the worst of it. There was a moment in the trial where Vernon Berange was representing, uh, Vernon Berange was representing James Cantor, and there were seven charges that uh, uh, Utah had said to, seven things that Utah said that uh, Cantor had committed. And Bahrain said, seven noughts is still one nought. Right? So that was the prosecutor. And it's vital for us to remember that prosecutors, especially in things that really matter, like criminal trials or trials where companies have done wrong things or state officials have done wrong things, uh, to have a good pr prosecutor, someone like Fusi Piccoli, is vital. Um, and to have a bad prosecutor presenting your case means that you can lose it. But he didn't lose it. Well, he lost it. He lost that case. And the Ravonia Trialists won that case. And we'll discuss why they won it when we discuss the politics further. Then there were another group of people, then there was another person there, Quartus de Bet. That uh, means Quartus de Bet. Uh, Quartus de Bet. Uh, and Quartus de Bet was a, apparently a very interesting judge. He didn't appear to take orders from the state, but he clearly had sympathy with, of course not sympathy, more than sympathy, he was clearly a, a supporter of Abate. And what the lawyers all say happened during the time, it was the first time that he spoke to black people, black men, in a situation where people weren't were equal and even smarter than him. You know, where when Nelson Mandela spoke, when Sisulu was cross-examination, when Katrada was uh, cross-examined, when all these things happened, he engaged with people and he was shocked at people's knowledge and the knowledge of history. 